Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see everybody here tonight. Thank you for coming along. And uh, young adults are just going to join me up here. And we're going to lead you in a few choruses just while others are gathering in. And do sing along and uh, help us out here. <laughs> okay. We're going to begin uh, by singing Beneath the Cross of Jesus. It's the newer version, the one by the Gettys. Beneath the Cross of Jesus, I find a place to stand and wonder at such mercy that calls me as I am. We're beginning with the cross of Christ. There's no gospel without the cross, and that's where I want to begin at this evening. So let's sing it together, remaining seated. Because of all that he's done for us, we want to praise him and we want to worship him. And that's what our next song says. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. We'll sing this one through twice.
It tells us so much in that little course about uh, going from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. And of course, uh, one day we're going to see him face to face if we belong to him, if, we've, if we're saved by his grace and by his mercy. And it's only because of the mercy of God that we're able to escape the punishment of hell and to be with the Lord forever. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Isn't it wonderful that the omniscient, all-knowing God pays no attention to the sins of those that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? It's not that He lets us off the hook, but they're already paid for in Christ. And as far as God's concerned, when He looks at us when we're saved, He sees no sins. And we have more awareness of our sin than God does once we put our trust in Him. What a wonderful position to be in. And we're going to sing about that this now. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. Thank you for singing so well. Thank you to the young adults as well for helping us out at the front. Just while they're sitting down now, we're going to begin our time together with our opening hymn, Years I Spent in Vanity and Pride, Caring Not. My Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me He died on Calvary. Let's stand together as we continue to worship the Lord.
Really, really good singing. Thank you so much for singing out so well. Now, we're going to come before the Lord in prayer and seek His help for our gathering this evening. It's great to have with us this evening to sing for us, the Holy Sisters. You're very welcome, girls, ladies, sorry. <laughs> and it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much for coming along tonight. And God bless you as you minister. To, and we're looking forward to hearing from Him in just a little moment. But we're going to uh, just come before the Lord and seek His help and His blessing for our time together this evening. Let's all pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we bow again thy presence when we have already been offering praise unto thee and giving thee thanks, Lord, for the great things that thou hast done for us. We praise thee, Father, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we praise thee, Lord, that there's a way back to God. We thank you, Father, that mercy at Calvary was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Lord, for many of us that are here this evening, we can say that we've been to Calvary. Our burdens have been taken away. We know that we're headed for heaven, and that's not arrogance on our part, but Father, it's simple faith in the promises that you have given that all who come unto thee through the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And Lord, we thank you for such a wonderful message and for a wonderful Savior one who was willing to take our place and bear our sins in his own body on the tree of Calvary and then to rise again from the dead on the third day. And Lord, we thank you that today there's a living and a risen Savior who is still able to save souls. Father, we thank thee for bringing us into this place this evening. We thank you, Lord, for all that are gathered, whether in person in the building here or online. And Father, we thank thee that we have this opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Father, we need thy help we dare not do it in our own strength. We pray, Lord, that we would know the help and the filling of the Holy Spirit tonight. And as we would seek to bring the gospel in, in through the preaching of the Word and through song, Lord, we pray that you'd be pleased to bless it and that thy Word would enter into hearts and that souls would be wonderfully saved. Lord, we thank you for your servants that have come to minister this evening. For the Holy Sisters, Lord, we pray that you'd bless them. Lord, that they would feel at home amongst us and Lord, that they would be blessed by Thee for serving Thee this evening. And Lord, we pray that You would help them and enable them. And Lord, pray that the words that they would sing would blend with the gospel that's preached and would speak into hearts even this evening. Lord, we pray that in all that takes place tonight, Christ would be lifted up. And we pray, Lord, that none will be seen save Him. But Lord, we do pray for those that are outside of the Savior. And Lord, in their own strength, they cannot understand the Word of God. It's its mysteries are hidden to them unless the Holy Spirit reveals it. And so, Lord, we pray that as your word goes forth tonight, may your Holy Spirit also go forth into hearts of those that are outside of Christ. May he, Lord, make the word of God clear and plain and understandable to them. And Lord, may he convict them of sin, of thy righteousness, and of the judgment, Lord, that they must face some someday when they stand before thee. And we pray, Lord, that they won't be at that great white throne. They'll not be there for condemnation, but, Lord, that they would come before uh, the, the seat of Christ, and, Lord, that they will be rewarded for what they do for thee. But, Lord, the only way they can be there is by trusting in the Savior. And so, Lord, we pray that you would save precious souls this evening, not just here, but throughout our land tonight. We live in a country that is desperate uh, for salvation, Lord, and we need Jesus Christ, to change the lives of many in our land. So, Lord, we pray that throughout our country, many would come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So, we ask, Lord, for a sense of your presence in our midst. We pray, Lord, that glory will be brought to thy name through all that we would say and do. And we leave it all in thy hands and in thy keeping, for we ask it in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to call upon the Holy Sisters to come, please, and bring their first two pieces in song. Thank you.
Well, thank you to the Holy Sisters for ministering those beautiful pieces in song. That second piece fitted in very, very well with what we're thinking about this morning as well. And uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing from them in just a little while. We're just going to turn to the Word of God at this point uh, before Michael comes to bring the announcements. And we're turning to Luke chapter 6, please. Luke chapter 6. We're going to begin at verse 1. Luke chapter 6. I'm beginning to read at verse 1. We've been looking at a little series on Christ criticized. Uh, Those times whenever the scribes and the Pharisees uh, looked for fault in the Savior. And uh, we've learned a lot in it already. And here's another uh, couple of instances that take place in the first 11 verses of Luke chapter 6. Beginning at verse 1 then, it says, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields, And his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this what David did, when himself was unhungered and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat but for the priests alone. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts." And said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful in the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Amen. We pray that God will bless His Word to our hearts this evening. Just ask Michael now to come and bring us the announcements. Thank you. Well, very good evening, everyone. You're all very welcome. And anybody visiting, perhaps for the first time, you're very welcome. The Holy Sisters and their escort. Lovely to see you here tonight. And thank you very much for that last piece you sang. It's very evocative in your mind that you bow the knee whenever you come before the Lord. You bow the knee. How many of us indeed do get down on our knees and praise the Lord and speak to the Lord on bended knee, which we should do often. Our speaker this evening is Rome Pastor David Cosby. And we thank the Lord that the Holy Sisters are now along to sing with us. And we thank them for those first two pieces. And we're looking forward to what the Lord has led in our hearts for the next piece. Tuesday at 8 p.m., Mark Collier from Friends in Action will bring a report on the mission work. Then on Friday at 6.30, Kids Zone and Youth Fellowship. The next Sunday, the Sunday school starts again at 10.15. Next Lord's Day, our own pastor will speak at both services. And please remember now, ladies, a date for your diary, which is the 4th of March. That's a ladies' coffee morning. It's always hard to say that, isn't it? Ladies' coffee morning. What about the men's? Oh, that's right, we have a breakfast, our breakfast coming up on Sundays. Yes, the ladies' coffee morning is on the 4th of March at 10 a.m. Amy Lennox is going to share her testimony. There's some invites in the back of the hall on your way out, if you'd like to lift one or two on your way out. Also, next Saturday morning, as I said, the men's breakfast is on at 9.30, and the speaker at that will be Stephen Riddle. Please remember all the missions we support from the church, especially our own brother Stephen, working with Shining Lights. And please remember all those who are in well, especially our own brother Sammy Murdoch. Sammy needs much prayer at this time. And it's wonderful to see Janice out tonight. God bless Janice. The Lord has been good to her, touched her, laid his hand upon her. Janice, lovely to see you. And we hope the Lord indeed will continue to bless you. And also now, a safeguard training time will be in the church on Monday the 24th of April from 7.30 to 9 p.m. The training is for everyone who is currently involved with children's work. 
children's youth work, as well as the young children within the church. Please plan to attend even if you've had training in the past. Details about how you can register will follow near the time. And the trainer will be David Jackson from CEF. Now, these are all the announcements that are made in the will of the Lord. Thank you. We're going to sing again before the Holy Sisters come and bring us their final piece in song. We're going to stand together and sing, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend his cause. Maintain the honor of his word, the glory of his cross. Returning to the cross of Christ again. Let's stand together and sing and then the Holy Sisters will come and minister.
Well, thank you again to the Holy Sisters for another beautiful piece. And uh, the invitation does continue to go out for all to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Thank you so much. And God bless you as you continue to serve him. This morning, we began thinking of some facts that don't seem to make sense. Tonight, I'm going to give you some laws that are a bit weird, and yet they're still in effect. Now, these are all laws in the United Kingdom. I know if we went to America, we'd find a whole host of them, but we wouldn't have long enough to go through all the stupid laws that the Americans make. But anyway, I hope there's no Americans here tonight. <laughs> but uh, these are all in the UK. According to the Salmon Act of 1986, it's illegal to handle a salmon in, a sus in suspicious circumstances in public. Now, what suspicious circumstances are, I don't know. The Metropolitan Police District has some of their own. It's illegal to carry a plank, ladder, wheel, pole, showboard, or hoop along the pavement. It's also illegal to shake or beat a carpet on the street during the day. In a law dating from 1322, that's still on the books, it's still compulsory that all beached whales and sturgeons must be offered to the reigning monarch. Back in 19, or sorry, 2018, there was a man, I think his name is Mr. Davies, who caught a nine-pound sturgeon, and he tested this law out and offered it to the queen, which she refused and said he was free to do with whatever he wanted. He then got in trouble for... Uh, catching a uh, protected species. But <laughs> it's actually still, believe it or not, illegal to be drunk in a pub. MPs are still not allowed to wear armor in Parliament. I think someone could do with it at times. And finally, according to a 2004 law, it's illegal to import Polish potatoes. Now, these are actual laws. They're on our statute books, and uh, apparently the Law Commission is meant to prune the, these, some of these out-of-date ones out, and they're just a bit slow at doing it. I think some of them are still stuck in 1322. But when it comes to the law, some of these sound pretty strange, but if you were a Jew in the first century Israel, the law, however strange it seemed to you, had to be kept. You just didn't break the law. And I'm not talking about the civil law. I'm talking, of course, about the religious law as it was described. The scribes and Pharisees were getting frustrated at not being able to catch out the Lord. And so they turned to the law, and in particular, the law concerning the Sabbath, hoping to catch the Lord doing something that was a breach of the law of Moses, or at least a breach of their interpretation of the law of Moses. And this led to what I've called the worry of the law. The Jews were worried constantly about breaking the law. Uh, and as I said, not just the law as written in the Torah, but the Sanhedrin had developed a full set of rules and regulations called the Halachat, a collection of laws and rules for how the Jews were to keep those biblical commandments. When it came to the Sabbath, these extra laws were incre incredibly strict. They've actually got a name there, the 39 Melachot, uh, 39 things that, they have to, that are prohibited to do on the Sabbath. These include carrying, burning, extinguishing, finishing, writing, er erasing, cooking, washing, sewing, tearing, knotting, untying, and tying. Shaping, plowing, planting, reaping, harvesting, threshing, winnowing, selecting, sifting, grinding, kneading, homing, spinning, dyeing, chain stitching, warping, weaving, unraveling, building, demolishing, trapping, shearing, slaughtering, skinning, tanning, smoothing, and marking. I try saying that off your top of your head. But whenever you start looking at some of these rules, they were incredibly complex. For, take, for example, the prohibition on selecting or sorting. If you had a, a bowl of grapes and raisins, and you didn't like the raisins and you wanted the grapes, you weren't allowed to take out the raisins and get rid of them and leave the grapes behind. You had to take out the grapes and leave the raisins behind, because otherwise you'd be breaking the law. Uh, on the same law, you're not allowed to take the bones from a fish. In fact, if you have fish, you can select the large pieces of fish and leave the small ones behind, but you're not allowed to take 
pieces of one kind of fish and leave behind pieces of another kind of fish. That's how intricate these laws have become. When it came to uh, things like uh, winnowing and and threshing, well, that's all to do with work. We can understand that, but these sorts of things come into the home as well. For example, kneading, as in K-N-E-A-D, kneading dough and that sort of thing, uh, you weren't allowed to make any kind of paste. So, on, on the Sabbath, you weren't allowed to make your gravy, for example, because that was making a paste. If you spat on the ground, you were guilty of breaking this law because that spittle mixed with the dust of the ground and it formed a paste, and therefore you were guilty of breaking this law. And so, to try to keep these laws was a real burden on the Jewish people. Now, the Sabbath was given specifically to the Jewish people. The Lord had said to Abraham that this would be, or to Moses, that this would be given to them as a commandment to be observed throughout their generations. This was something that would set the Jewish people apart from every other group of people in the world. And so, they were expected to adhere to these. Nowadays, it gets even more complicated because, for example, if we think of setting a fire, kindling a fire, or extinguishing a fire, that includes things like starting your car. As soon as you start the car, you're igniting a fire in the engine. If you turn the engine off, you're extinguishing the fire. So, if you want to get anywhere, you have to go before Sabbath begins or after Sabbath ends. If, if you're in the house, they include things like using electricity under this because you're using energy. So, if you open the door of your fridge and the light comes on, you're breaking the laws of the Sabbath because a piece of metal is heating up and making light. And so, you have to unscrew the bulb in your fridge the day before Sabbath so that if you open the door, the light doesn't come on. That's how strict these laws are. You can see how it was a burden. Now, we don't have anything like that kind of strictness. We don't have anything like that uh, here or in our culture even. But you imagine a Jewish person living under this. The law was almost impossible to keep perfectly. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were the experts at this, at least publicly. They were the experts. But they were held up as such an example that the Lord used them as an example. In Matthew chapter 5, whenever he was giving the Sermon on the Mount, he said in verse 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the public image of the scribes and Pharisees was that they kept the law perfectly. They didn't break one law. They were so strict and so intricate about keeping this law. There was no one better in Israel at keeping the law of Moses than the scribes and Pharisees. And yet the Lord Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that, you can in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. See, the Bible teaches us that there is none righteous, no, not one. It teaches us that there is none that doeth good. Something we were thinking about this morning. There is none that doeth good. It teaches us that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. God is looking for absolute perfection. If it were possible to keep the law, God would make that as the way to heaven. But it's impossible to keep the law. It's because we are sinners that we can't keep the law. It's because we're sinners that it's impossible for us to reach God's standard. I'm not talking about the standard that the Sanhedrin set. That was a far more intricate, a far more complicated standard. The Lord, for example, gave ten universal commands for the whole world that God should come before everything else, that there should be no idols, no um, manufactured image of God, whether that's physically in front of us or even in our minds, that we shouldn't take the name of the Lord our God in vain, that we should remember one day in seven for the Lord. For the Jews, it was the Sabbath. For us, as long as we have one day in seven that we keep for the Lord, that we're to honor our father and our mother, that we're not to kill. The Lord said that even hating without cause is the same as killing. We're not to commit adultery. The Lord said that even looking with lust is the same as committing adultery, that we're not to steal, that we're not to lie, that we're not to covet. 
Now, those are very simple to understand, and yet we can't even keep them. In fact, we're told in the Word of God that if we keep all the law yet offend in one point, we are guilty of breaking it all. You see, the law was not given to us as a means of getting to heaven. The Word of God was not given as a way of reaching God. It's impossible for us to do so. The reason the law was given, we find in Galatians 3 and verse 24, where it says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified, not by the law, but by faith. I know what it's like to be a schoolmaster, a teacher. I was one for 13 years. And I was, one of the, I was one of two teachers in the school that no one wanted to be sent to. And I, I, could, I could raise my voice. Now, you have not heard me raise my voice. None of you have heard me raise my voice. Well, maybe the girls have at one time, I don't know. But uh, you have never heard me raise my voice. But I can remember on one occasion, I was telling somebody off or something. can't even remember what it was. But in our building, it was an L-shaped building, and I was at one end upstairs. And there was a technology room at the other end of the building downstairs. There was about eight sets of doors you had to go through to get to it. And the teacher standing outside that classroom heard me shouting at the other end of the building. <laughs> Sometimes it had to be done. But what was the point? What was the point of a teacher? It's a point, the point of a teacher is to bring them to knowledge, is to bring them to uh, a bit closer to being perfect in their education, perfect in their knowledge on on certain subjects. The law is our schoolmaster to give us the knowledge of who Christ is so that we can come to Christ, so that we can know that He is the way, the truth, and the life, not the law. The law is only a signpost to direct us towards the Lord Jesus Christ. The law cannot save. In fact, Paul said in Romans chapter 3, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law reveals our sin to us. In Jewish times, not just the law of Moses, not just the law of the Scriptures, but these other additional laws were used as ammunition by the scribes and Pharisees to pick holes in people's lives so that they could show themselves as being better than the, than the ordinary common people. So whenever the Lord walked through a cornfield on the Sabbath day, and His disciples were walking with Him, and they were hungry, We're told that his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. Now, by doing that, they broke two other commands for the Sabbath. They were harvesting. They were plucking the corn off the ears. So that that was counted as harvesting. And then we're told that they rubbed them in their hands. They did that to get the chaff off and to get to the the kernel underneath. Uh, But of course, by doing that, that's the same thing as, as, as winnowing grinding and winnowing and threshing, it it all comes under that that banner. So they were breaking another law of the Sabbath. And so this is why the Pharisees then said, why do you that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And so the law was used to pick holes in them. Whenever it came to the Lord in the synagogue and this man with the withered hand coming to him, uh, and he, it seems that he was deliberately placed there by the Pharisees and the scribes to try to, take, to, to, to find some fault in the Lord Jesus Christ because they were there and watching him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. Do you know why that was breaking the law? Because to heal on the Sabbath day was to make something perfect. It was to repair something, in this case, someone. Finishing something was against the Sabbath law. If you're writing a, a, a story or if you're writing um, some kind of document, you weren't allowed to finish that document. In fact, you weren't allowed to write more than two letters on the Sabbath. And you weren't allowed to rub out more than two letters. But this applied to every area of life. They weren't allowed to finish. They weren't allowed to repair anything. And healing somebody in the minds of the Pharisees and the scribes was the same thing as repairing. And therefore, it was against the Sabbath law. 
and they were watching the Lord Jesus Christ. They were trying to catch him out. Folks, there, we, we cannot keep the law, let alone the law that the scribes and the Pharisees were enforcing upon the people. We cannot keep the law of God. It's impossible for us to do so. When we read about Noah, we're told that Noah was perfect in his generations. It doesn't mean that he lived a perfect life. It meant that he had an unspoiled heritage behind him, an unspoiled ancestry. It's got nothing to do about how he lived his life. There is nobody in the Bible, no matter who we think of, that had no sin in them except the Lord Jesus Christ. Even Daniel, for, for whom hardly anything negative is said, even Daniel was a sinner before God. Even Daniel had to come before God and pray three times a day because he knew his own weakness as a sinner before God who needed God's salvation. Joseph, who was such a, a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, even Joseph had his faults. And yet he's presented so wonderfully in Scripture. Folks, we, are, we aren't even close to being as good as those men are portrayed to be in Scripture. There is nobody in this church, there is nobody in this town, in this country, in this world who is perfect at keeping the law of God. And every time we break the law of God, God has placed within us a conscience that declares our guilt, that accuses us when we break the law of God. Not the law of man, but the law of God. And when we break the law of God, His Holy Spirit works with our conscience and brings us under that conviction. And folks, if you're under conviction of sin, if you're under conviction of sin, if you know that you're a sinner before God, you need to get that put right now. If you've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sin, you need to get that put right now. There's no point in putting it off because we don't know how much time you have. We don't know how many opportunities you have to be saved. The only opportunity I can guarantee that you have is now. Because God has brought you to this message to hear it and to save your soul if you'd only cry out to Him. The law causes us to worry because the law can't save. All it can do is point out our faults. But I want you to see as well the wisdom of the Lord. When He's answering the Pharisees concerning the first incident of the disciples plucking the ears of corn, He takes one of the highest revered people in Jewish history, the King David. And King David, whenever he was on the run from Saul, came to the tabernacle one day where the table of showbread was in the holy place, and he asked the priests for the bread from the table of showbread. Now, that was against the law of Moses. According to the law of Moses, it, as the Lord says here, it was only lawful for the priests to take the showbread and to eat the showbread. It was reserved only for the priests. But because of the circumstances, because David and his men were so hungry, because they had been without food for so long, it was permitted for David to break that law so that he and his men could survive, so that their lives could be preserved. Even on the Sabbath, many of these laws and the intricacies of them can be broken if it means a life gets saved or even that a life could be saved. And so, the, the Lord, whenever He was speaking through, to these Pharisees, He was showing off their hypocrisy. He was showing to them, you keep every single letter of the law, at least you proclaim that you do anyway, but you have no love in your heart. You have no concern for human beings that are surrounding you. You have no concern for those who are in need. You have no concern for your fellow citizens who are hungry for real food, who are hungry for real spiritual food and need to have that spiritual satisfaction, not just the, the physical satisfaction we need day by day. We need that spiritual satisfaction. We live in a world that is living off antidepressants, a world that is living off tablets to try to soothe their minds and to control their minds, to give them some kind of peace or some kind of even oblivion. The drug crisis is through the roof because people are so upset and they're so concerned and stressed and worried about the world that we live in today, and they see everything that's happened, that the, the drugs are flying off the shelves, are flying off the, the back street corners. 
where the illegal drugs are being sold. Why? Because people can't handle the world that we live in. It's so wicked. But we have a message to bring to them that can bring them deliverance from that fear because the Bible tells us that perfect love casteth out fear. And where are we going to find perfect love? We can only find it in God. His agape love, His unconditional love, that love that's absolutely perfect, that that's absolutely unconditional, where He offers Jesus Christ and salvation to everyone so that all might be saved. And the Word of God, this gospel of Christ, is unto all, but it's only coming upon all that believe. You see, this is a universal message that everyone can hear, that everyone can believe in, but only those who actually believe, only those who actually put their trust in Christ will be saved. The Lord's declaring the, the compassion of God. God didn't strike David down. We know it was that we can see the love of God in that. What happened whenever Korah, Dathan, and Abiram offered strange fire unto the Lord? The ground opened up and swallowed them. What happened whenever Achan took of the unclean thing of the city of Jericho? He and his whole family were stoned until they died, and then their bodies were burnt. What happened whenever uh, the children of Israel murmured and complained against God's leader, Moses? God sent fiery serpents into their midst, and 22,000 died in one day. But David, whenever he took the showbread, something that was completely banned by the law of Moses, God didn't strike him down. Why? Because God is a loving and a merciful and a compassionate God. And he saw David's need, and this was the only place where David was going to get food. Our God is a loving God. Around the table this morning, Ian was reminding us of that time when the Lord was crucified and, and the thief was on the cross beside him. And the thief cried out to him and says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The Lord turns to this thief who is being crucified for all of his crimes, one of the most wicked men in the country. And the Lord turned to this thief and he says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What love? And even before that, when they had nailed the Lord to the tree and the people were mocking Him and making fun of Him and the scribes and the Pharisees were pouring scorn on Him and telling Him, if you're the Son of God, come down and save yourself. Even then, the Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the love of God. They were blaspheming the name of Christ. And Jesus himself said, Father, forgive them. You see, it's not just the wisdom of God that we see here. It's not just the wisdom of the Lord. We see his love. What happened then whenever this man with the withered hand came? The Lord sees this man with the withered hand, and he knows that the scribes and the Pharisees are watching, waiting to catch him out, waiting to see him do something to heal this man. With blind people, he had made a paste and put it on their eyes, or he had touched them, or he had touched a leper, or he had touched someone who was lame, or he had touched the ears or the tongue of someone who was deaf and mute and brought hearing and speech back to them again. What was he going to do with this man? Well, the Lord stood back. He brought the man into the middle of the room. He says, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Now, why did he bring him into the middle? so that everybody could see that the Lord Jesus wasn't touching him. The Lord Jesus was nowhere near him. The man stood in the middle, and all he said, I will ask you one thing, he says to the scribes and Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He was calling out the hypocrisy. And he looked around at them all and in Mark's gospel, it says, when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. Jesus didn't touch him. He didn't wave his hand over him. He didn't say any other words to him. See the wisdom of the Lord here? If he had touched him, if he had shown by some action that he himself was healing this man, they would have accused him. 
Why was that important? Because the Lord said that He didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He came to show how perfect righteousness lives, how perfection is. And so the Lord never touched this man, and He just stretched forth His hand, and immediately He was healed. Folks, that's all we need to do for salvation. In fact, we don't even need to lift a hand. We just lift up our heart and our voice to God and we confess to Him that we're a sinner and that we need salvation through Christ. And if we come through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ alone, God promises that He'll save us from our sin. That's how simple it is. He doesn't need to send an angel down. He doesn't need to we don't need bright lights and lightning and thunder, and we don't need some voice from heaven. All we need is simple faith, just like this man. Simple faith. Just stretch out your hand. Just lift up your voice to God. Ask Him to save you and you'll be saved. That's how simple it is. And these laws of men weren't even breached by the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't have to keep the laws of men. But He even kept them in front of the scribes and the Pharisees, showed himself as perfect. Folks, only someone that is perfect could ever save us from our sin. We needed a perfect sacrifice that could come to God and act as our substitute, bearing our sin, so that we could have a way back to God. And praise God, the Lord Jesus Christ was that man. He was that sacrifice. And I want to finish by looking at the wickedness of the leaders. You see, these men were trying to catch out the Lord Jesus Christ. And they had failed in it. And they were not just frustrated about it, they were angry about it. In fact, in verse 11 it says they were filled with madness. They were filled with madness. You know, whenever the Lord speaks to a heart, whenever the Lord reveals sin to a heart, the correct response is to agree with him and admit that we're sinners. But these men were so hard-hearted, they would not, not that they could not, they would not admit their sin. They were so hard-hearted that that conviction that was in them that they were sinners and that they tried to suppress filled them with absolute madness. You know why we see such opposition today to biblical truth? Because the world has the same attitude as these scribes and Pharisees. Whenever we tell the world today what God's standards of righteousness are, what God's standards of morality are, standards that the world refuses to accept, the world gets mad. And the world goes mad. And the world will riot, and the world will, will, will target individuals, and the world will try to, all that they can to silence and to cancel anyone who would dare contradict their immorality. Whenever we stand upon the Word of God, whenever we preach the truth of God's Word, we will always have that opposition. They communed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Folks, don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees. Don't wonder about what you're going to do to Jesus or what you're going to do to the people of God who preach Jesus. Think about what you're going to do with Jesus. What are you going to do with Jesus tonight? Are you going to accept Him as your Savior, as your Lord, as the one that you need to save you from sin because you know that you've broken the law of God? You know that you're a sinner. Don't try to deny it. Don't say that you're better than other people. You know in your heart of hearts there are thoughts that you've had that are against God. There are things that you have thought in your mind and in your heart that are evil and wicked against God. You may not have stolen any, any precious item, but perhaps you've stolen time from an employer. You may not have committed adultery with anyone, but perhaps you've looked with lust upon a woman or upon a man, depending on who you are. You might not have laid down or, or bowed down in front of a gold or a stone statue of a God, but you've created an idea of God in your mind, and you've broken the second commandment, and you know that you're a sinner. 
Don't try to shift the blame. Try to find forgiveness. And come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was perfect, and the one today who still says, stretch forth thy hand, and I will save you. Whenever Peter was commanded to come to Jesus on the water of the lake, and he saw the wind and the waves about him, and he began to sink, he only cried out three simple words, Lord, save me. And his hand was reached out, and the Lord Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him out of the waves and saved his life. Folks, the Lord will do the same thing for you and with your soul. He'll lift you up out of the filthiness of this world. He'll save your precious soul. You'll be safe for all eternity, but you need to come to him. You need to stretch out your hand. And he'll take it and he'll save you. I trust that you'll not try to depend on keeping of law to get to God, because we'll all fail. But Jesus Christ made the way. And he invites you to come to him now. I want to sing in closing, I have a message from the Lord, hallelujah. The message unto you I'll give, tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Let's stand together, please, as we sing. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you that we don't need to keep a lot of laws in order to earn a place in heaven. But we simply have to reach out. We have to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can save us, and he will give us that new life that we need. And Father, we thank thee that what the law could never do, Christ is able to do, and he's able to do it tonight. If only a sinner would confess that they're a sinner, confess their sin before thee, and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, we pray that you would speak into hearts tonight. Speak into the hearts of those, Lord, that are outside of Christ and until now have constantly rejected him. But Lord, tonight may they call out to him, may they put out the hand, stretch forth their hand and receive Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord of their lives. Save precious souls tonight, we pray. And Lord, we ask you that now that you would guard us and keep us as we would separate. Take us home in safety, we pray, especially those that aren't yet ready for eternity. For we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen.